Mike Francis, I am so honored and really privileged to have you join me today. Uh, you have an incredibly storied history and a very unique one at that. You're the son of former underboss of the Colombo crime family, Sonny Francis, and you yourself, a former capo regime. But you not only lived that lifestyle, but you also exited that lifestyle, which frankly never happens uh, in terms of the subsequent chapter being, as you say, safe and free. So today we're going to talk about your experience as part of the Colombo crime family before, during, and after. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, Emily. I appreciate it. So let's start with those initial days and growing up uh, before you even knew really what your father did. Share what, what that was like. Well, you know, my dad was such a high profile figure. Um, you know, he was kind of like the John Gotti of his day. So really it started, you know, very early on in my life that I knew who my dad was. I knew it was something different because, you know, law enforcement tactics against organized crime were very different back then than they are today. Today, everything is very covert a lot of undercover informants, high-tech surveillance equipment. Today, get, somebody can be under investigation and not know about it until it's too late. But back in my day, when I was growing up, my dad was under investigation from seven or eight different agencies. Every one of them would have a car parked around my house 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I was one of seven kids. Whenever we as a family would leave to go anywhere, we had a parade of law enforcement vehicles following us. So early on from the time I was three or four years old and was able to realize that, you know, I knew something was different with my dad. And, you know, it was very turbulent because he was uh, arrested several times, you know, three times, at least in the state of New York, and went to trial three times. Um, then in the early 60s, um, you know, he was indicted in federal court for masterminding a nationwide string of bank robberies. And uh, he went to trial in 66. He was convicted in 67, sentenced to 50 years in prison, which at that time, Emily, was the longest sentence for a bank robbery conspiracy case ever given up to that point. And, uh, and then he went off to do his time in 1970. So throughout that whole time, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, I kind of knew what my dad was. And, uh, you know, that was the lifestyle for me. And, you know, for me, I love my dad. I mean, I idolized him. And so I grew up always believing law enforcement and the government were the enemies. That's how I looked at it. That's exactly what I was going to ask. How did that sort of color your interpretation as that lifestyle was normalized and that style of living over three decades? You mentioned that it was really turbulent. And during the trial for your father, uh, in part, your brother testified against him. Can you describe a little bit about that for listeners? Yeah, well, that happened later on, Emily. Well, my dad, he was he was tried mm -hmm. originally in the early 60s, three times in the state of New York, uh, twice for grand larceny, once for homicide. And, uh, you know, there were serious, obviously, offenses. And my dad was in, in jail for, uh, you know, several months while he was awaiting trial on all three of those cases. Um, but he was acquitted in all three of them. Then he gets indicted in uh, the feds for masterminding that uh, bank robbery. And uh, he got sentenced to 50 years. When he went off to prison in 1970, I was a pre-med student. I was going to be a doctor, Hofstra University in New York. And my whole life changed at that point because Joe Colombo became, he was the boss. He was, you know, I, I knew him very well. He kind of took me under his wing, started to meet a lot of my dad's friends. Mike, what are you doing going to school? If you don't help your father out, he's going to die in prison. And Emily, I'll tell you this. My dad obviously did a lot of bad things in his life, you know, and so did I. I went to jail for a crime I was guilty of. But that particular crime that my dad did 40 years in prison, on, 40 years, he was innocent, innocent of. My dad was no bank robber. And I'll take that to my grave. I investigated that case. We spoke to every witness that testified against him. They recanted their testimony. We gave him lie detector test. We could never uh, prove his, his innocence, you know, so we did 40 years on the 50. And yeah, that left, left a very bitter taste in my mouth for law enforcement because I said, hey, you know, they framed my dad, even though he was who he was, I loved him and they framed him for a crime he didn't commit. And it was destructive to our family. I mean, very destructive. So I grew up with that resentment and that kind of bitterness. And um, obviously I feel differently now, but that's, that's kind of what shaped my life. And while he was inside, what was communication and visits like for him with you and with the family and what 
restrictions did he have, if any, uh, with his work with the Colombo crime family? Well, when he went in, you know, again, the prison system was different than it is now. Back then, Mm -hmm. he was only allowed one three-minute phone call a month and one visit a month, one day of visiting. And he spent most of his time early on in Leavenworth Penitentiary. So we had to fly to Kansas to see him. And what we used to do, we would see him, we would go the last day of the month, the first day of the next month. So we spent two days back to back with him. Uh, But, you know, one three minute phone call. uh, After a while, my dad didn't become relevant in the family because, you know, we're dealing with everyday family life. And I was the oldest of, you know, uh, my brothers and sisters. And so I became more like the father figure in the house. I took care of them, tried to take care of my mom as best I could. Um, but, you know, I mean, we loved him and everything, but when somebody's not physically there and they're not in contact with you and you can't really communicate other than letters and, you know, uh, visits like they were, it's very, very hard. So um, very destructive of the family. You know, I say this all the time, Emily, the mob life is an evil lifestyle. And I'm not saying that, I'm not calling the guys evil. I was one of them. I just happen to be very fortunate, very blessed. But the lifestyle is evil because I don't know any family of any member of that life that hasn't been totally devastated, including my own. And not my wife and kids now, but mother, father, brother, sisters, devastating. If I tell you the, you know, the whole history, it was devastating. And I don't know any family of any member of that life that hasn't met the same fate. So any lifestyle that does that to a family, it's a bad life. And are those issues from coping? Is it drug and alcohol use and communication? Is it betrayal? Is it the wedge that law enforcement can drive through a family when you are uh, dealing with convictions and the like? You know, it's all of that. You know, my mom and dad, obviously, they grew apart. My mom passed away in 2012 but she spent 33 years without her husband. And, you know, at the end of her relationship, I can only describe her relationship with my dad as ugly because she blamed him for everything that went wrong in the family. Now, what went wrong? I had a sister, 27 years old, died of an overdose of drugs. My brother was 25 years a drug addict. And yes, he eventually did cooperate with law enforcement, testified against my dad, to send my dad back to prison. So a father turning on his son. You know, I had a younger sister, 41 years old. She died. She wasn't really mentally stable. She died young, too. So the whole family was destroyed. And it's it's a combination of everything. You know, this resentment towards law enforcement, the breakup of the family, you know, seeing what my mom went through, the kids turning to drugs. It was uh, it was just a mess. You know, it's it was, it's a bad situation. Yeah. You mentioned while your father was inside the first time that his friends and colleagues in the Colombo family came to you and said, now is the time for you to step up. What was their level of support like for your family when um, that, sorry, excuse me for a second, Mike, Devin, sure. Devin, that was my alarm. So this, the, this was for the 3.30. So I'm sorry, Mike, can you excuse me for okay. one second? Yeah, no problem. No problem. Um, so we were going to put a, um, we were going to put a marker on this. Okay, copy, thank you. Um, so we're gonna do, um, okay. All my lost CLE stuff, it's like insane. Okay, so that should be fine. And I'm gonna start with that question again, Mike, thank you for your sure. patience. <sighs> okay. Um, so you mentioned, the first time that your father was inside, you mentioned that his colleagues and and friends in the Colombo crime family came to you and said, now is the time for you to step up. What was their support like, however, for your family, for your six siblings and your mother while your father was inside for so long? Did you guys feel taken care of and supported by the Colombo family during that time? You know, honestly, no. You know, there's a, uh, a fallacy in thought there that when you know, a guy goes to prison that the family rallies around and takes care of the family. And that's just not true. You know, my dad had business on the street and that was taken care of from him. But when that business ran out, that was it. And that lasted maybe two years. And after that, we were on her own, on our own, you know, so I was kind of in a position where I had to, you know, help support the family. And so I dropped out of college 
And I went to see my dad. We were in the visiting room in Leavenworth Penitentiary. And I said, Dad, I'm not going to school anymore. If I don't help you out, you're going to die in here. 50 years. You know, he was 50 when he went in. He had 50 on top of that. I figured it was a death sentence. So, you know, and he, he looked me in the eye and he said to me, you know, son, I'm innocent. You know, I've been framed on this case. We have to prove my innocence. So I said, OK, fine. You know, just what do I have to do? Tell me what to do. I said, we need money. You know, we need to uh, track down these witnesses. And he looked at me and he said, you know, if you're going to be on the street, I want you on the street the right way. In his mind, the right way was to become a member of his life. So it was at that point that he proposed me for membership into the family, because really, you're on your own at that point, Emily. We, we had to take care of ourselves. And, uh, you know, like I said, there's a fallacy out there. A guy goes away, the family takes care of him. Not true. Now, there could be some cases where that might happen, but generally, that's not the case. And you had been told your whole life by your father that he didn't want you part of that life. You were in medical school at that time. So what did that change feel like? And what did that adjustment feel like for you? Did you feel convicted with a sense of purpose or did you feel that the about face was confusing? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, look, I didn't want my dad to die in prison. I didn't want the family disrupted. So I thought, you know, the higher calling for me was to help my dad. So, you know, you have these defining moments in your life. <clears throat> and obviously sitting with my dad and him proposing me into a criminal lifestyle. I mean, it was a life changing experience for me. And my life went in a totally different direction. But originally, he didn't want that for me. You know, he said, son, get an education, stay off the street. He wanted me to be the first professional in the family. That meant something to him. And so he was, you know, he was upset initially when I made that decision. But, you know, I think in the long run, he was happy about it because he knew I was there to help him and really did it for him. You know, I never aspired when I was a kid, even though I knew who my dad was, I didn't want to be a mob guy. You know, that wasn't my aspiration. A lot of guys in that life, this is the life that they aspired to be in all that time. They grew up in Brooklyn. They saw the guys around them. And that's what they wanted to be. It wasn't that for me. I, I got into that life really to help my dad. And so you did you see it or think of it as a short term engagement? Or did you know at the time, did you appreciate that his membership proposal meant normally we know that with you, it, it was a different story, but that it normally and typically meant a, a an absolute lifetime commitment. Did you appreciate that at that time? No, I, I knew that once I was in, I was in for life. And, um, you know, I had a very idealistic view of the life at that point, because to me, I was going to be part of something my dad was part of. You know, I looked at it as a, a, a uh, you know, a life of respect and honor. You know, when I first got into the life, they told me, Michael, anywhere you go in this world, you're going to have backup. Somebody's going to have your back. This is a brotherhood. Don't ever worry about your wife, your sister, your daughter, your mother. Nobody's ever going to hurt them. You know, it's a brotherhood. And that's very powerful, you know, to men, you know, to have that feeling. So, I mean, I was exhilarated, you know, the night I got made. Uh, to me, it was like the best thing in the world up, up until that point in my life. I had a very idealistic view of it. And I think when you add on to that, that sense, that profound sense of brotherhood um, and, and that sense of belonging, when you, when you add that to the landscape of feeling totally betrayed by one's government and law enforcement um, and ha having your dad be put inside for this long sentence and, and you knew he was innocent, all of those factors sort of, I think, um, likely led to this galvanizing sense on, for you and for all of your colleagues there and your friends and family in the Colombo crime family. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and, you know, look, we had kind of a code on the street. We understood that the government law enforcement, their job was to come after us. We got it, you know, mm -hmm. and we even, you know, and I had conversation with them. I said, listen, you do your job. You know, I, I understand that. Just don't frame us. Don't frame us. You want to get us, get us the right way. And when that happened, we understood it. There was no really hard feelings. That was it. But, you know, when they overstepped the, the line and me, I had that bitterness because I knew my dad was framed. I believed it with all my heart. I'll take it to my grave. I believe it now. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to deal with, Emily. It really is. And, you know, I, 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 did that shape my life, the early part of my life? It, it really did. And that's why I looked at, you know, Cosa Nostra, as we call it here in this country, as something great. 
And yeah, I was in it for life. When I got in, I was motivated to do two things. Number one, I wanted to get my dad out of prison, which I did. After 10 years, he made parole. My dad made parole five times and got uh, violated five times, each time for association. He just couldn't stay away. Mm -hmm. And so that's totaled the 40 years that he did. But, uh, but I was motivated to get him out. And secondly, I wanted to make money. My dad said, in this life, you make money. It translates to power, not unlike the real world. So I was fortunate. I knew how to use that life to benefit me in business. I was very aggressive on the street. I worked hard and I brought some new things into the family they hadn't done before and went on to make a very significant amount of money. That's how, I, you know, you come in as a soldier and then they made me a cop regime because I was doing well in that life. And what were some of those new things that you brought? Well, you know, I mean, look, I had a lot of legitimate businesses also. I had two car agencies. I had a film production company. I had a number of restaurants that I was involved in. I had a leasing company. So I was very aggressive in that way. But the biggest, I would have to call it scam that I got involved in was the wholesale gasoline business. And to make a very long story short, over a seven year period, I had devised a scheme along with others that worked with me uh, to defraud the government out of tax on every gallon of gasoline. And um, over that seven year period, we were selling a half a billion gallons of gas a month, and we were taking down 30 to 40 cents a gallon. We were bringing eight to $10 million a week into our, our operations. So it was, it was probably the biggest money earner uh, that that life saw since the days of prohibition. Can you share with the eight to $10 million a week, can you share percentages or portions of what of that would go to which members and how that all worked? Because I think in a lot of the movies and books, you know, we see everyone getting their cut and stopping in and getting this and you as the capo regime with this business, how did that play out? How did the allocations play out? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, we had kind of a formula. If I brought something into that life and I brought a business in a deal, uh, because it was my deal and I really didn't need any help, I would give the family, the boss, 25% of whatever I earned, 25%. Mm -hmm. That was the formula. So when I first realized what I had in this business, I went to my boss, Carmine Persico, who's passed away. Now he was uh, in, you know, convicted on a commission case by Giuliani. He died in prison in 2019. He was my boss. But I went to him and I said, Junior, called him Junior. I said, I came across something. I'm going to show you more money than you've ever seen in your life. And he immediately looked at me and said, no drugs. We don't get involved in drugs. And I said, Junior, you know I hate drugs. We don't deal. We weren't allowed to deal with drugs back then. I said, it's gas. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, it's complicated. Don't worry about it. I said, but here's the deal. I said, everybody's going to want to get involved in this. You have to keep everybody else out. Because when too many people get involved on the street, everything gets ruined. I said, keep everybody out. I said, if we have an argument, I got to win 100%. I said, don't play politics with any of the other families. I said, you do that and I'll make you extremely wealthy. And he looked at me, I'll never forget. And you know, he was a tough guy and he said, show me. I said, okay. Well, I started bringing him in $2 million a week. And $2 million a week, Emily, in that life buys a lot of loyalty. Trust me, right? So, um, and I never lost an argument. I sat down with John Gotti and everybody. I never lost an argument because they were protecting that money flow. And then after a little time, he made me a capo regime. I was a soldier when I brought this uh, into the family, but he made me a capo. And uh, it was, uh, you know, we had a seven year run with that. So we made a lot of what money. What struck so, me. So 25% to that. Sorry. Yeah. And then, you know, I mean, listen, I can't complain. I did extremely well. I had my own jet plane. I had a helicopter. I had a house in Florida, a house in New York, a house in California. I had 300 guys under me ready to do anything I, I told them to do. And I had the Russian crew from Benson, uh, from uh, Brighton Beach that were part of my crew. So, you know, we had, a, we had it going on. What struck me too about this, about that business of yours, so you talk about 25% goes to the head. How much of that was going to politicians and law enforcement? Because when you described setting that up, um, you know, you were, you had, at your behest, politicians, including Mead Esposito, who got you 18 licenses for this gas wholesale when normally, I think the average was was one license you know, yeah. per year or something per someone, and you got 18. So when you talk about how 
you know, it, it sounds simple for us, the listener, but it was in part because you had on that same payroll people that, that made it easy for you that otherwise would have made it challenging. So of the other 75%, how much of that was going to the people that were essentially looking the other way? Well, we did take care of politicians and Meet Esposito was, uh, you know, he was associate at the time. And yeah, it was difficult to get the licenses. I actually had 18 Panamanian corporations and each one of them were licensed and we were able to get the license. We had licenses in Florida. We had licenses in New York. Uh, we were starting to move out to Texas and California. And it was all through political context because you couldn't get them, especially somebody like me. But we had it set up. It was a, it was a very sophisticated uh, set up and scheme in order to get all of this done. And so, you know, we took very good care of them. And, you know, look, I say this all the time. People say, Michael, everybody that you were dealing with, they were all Democrats. And I said, well, at that time, Democrats were easy to corrupt. You know, what do you want me to say? That's who we were working with at the time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we, we spread the wealth around. We, we really did. And, you know, a, a lot of people ask about law enforcement. Do we have them on our payroll? And I want to kind of set the table for that. You know, we had 750 made guys, guys that actually took the oath that comprised all five families in New York. So that was a lot. We had a lot of associates, but 750 that made guys. And a lot of us had a relative in law enforcement, a neighbor in law enforcement, a friend, somebody we went to school with. So we had a lot of contacts with law enforcement. And so, you know, they did our bidding. I mean, there was one police pre precinct in Brooklyn that, you know, two o'clock in the morning, anytime I wanted to, I can go up and look at all the files in their file cabinet to see if any of my guys were in trouble or anything that, you know, they might have had brewing. So we had those contacts back then. And uh, yeah, they helped us a lot. You know, um, I have to admit it. Well, and I think it illustrates the culture, especially back then. First of all, it's not some binary, you know, black and white lens that movies and Hollywood portrays things as to your point. Their families and humans are involved, which means that everyone knows somebody that is either inside or doing something bad or part of law enforcement, et cetera. It's not so, it's not so cut and dried. Um, that's number one. And number two is that, uh, I, as, as you said um, before, that those guys were smart. You know, that a lot of times that these, the made men or their soldiers or whatnot are portrayed as, as, simple minded. But the whole point is that there were a lot of shrewd businessmen involved with, again, in these entrenched families and cultures, uh, which meant that relationships were developed and people were beholden because of money and because of loyalty and because of what could be public shame and total disaster. You know, once you got a politician on the payroll, that was it. You had them for life because they could never, ever risk being exposed. Yeah, no question. You know, understand that you said you made a very good point. You know, Mafia Cosa Nostra in America, we had a lot of power and control under some very difficult conditions for a century, basically a hundred years, you know, until Rico came in in the 80s and started to, you know, really uh, put a dent in the families. But we had a lot of control. I mean, we had control right into the White House. You know, we controlled all the unions. You control the unions, the Teamsters, and you control, you know, the docks. You control the country in a big way. Why? Politically, because number one, you have votes, you control, you know, millions of people. And number two, you have money, you know, votes and money are what politicians want. And if you can provide that for them and do it in a way where, hey, we're never going to give you up. You know, we're street guys. You're safe with us. And they and they take that to heart. So it wasn't easy. I mean, it wasn't difficult, rather, to get around these people and have them do the, the, your bidding. And, you know, we didn't ask them to do hard. We didn't ask them to kill anybody or anything like that. We just needed favors and they they were quick to oblige. But, um, you know, we, we had a lot of strength in this country for a lot of years. And a lot of guys were very smart. You know, you take Frank Costello. They called him the prime minister. Mm -hmm. Brilliant guy. You know, Joe Colombo, who I was very close to, you know, is our family. Very, very smart guy. You know, even Persico, my boss, smart guy, Paul Castellano. Very smart guy. You don't sell these guys short. If they were in a legitimate world, they would have done well also, you know, no question. So going back to your father proposing membership, and you talk about the night that you got made. Walk us through what that all looked like, uh, your, the, the time that you had to prove yourself, eventually being made, what, what that X's and O's looked like. Okay. Well, you know, I came in, I was like 21 years old when I was a recruit. 
And when I first sat down with Tom DeBella, who was the acting boss at that time, he's passed away now. He said, Mike, I got a message from your father. He said, you want to become a member of our life. Is that true? I said, yes. He said, here's the deal. From now on, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're on call to serve this family, the Colombo family. He said, that means if your mother is sick and she's dying and you're at her bedside, we call you to service, you leave your mother, you come and serve us. From now on, we're number one in your life before anything and everything. When and if we feel you deserve this privilege, this honor to become a member, we'll let you know. And then you're a recruit. And for the next two and a half years, I'm on call every day to do whatever I'm told to do. And that could be something very menial. You know, I always had a nice car, so drive the bus to a meeting, sit in the car for two, three, four hours. You know, Emily, God forbid you get out, you go get a newspaper, or you go to the restroom, he comes out, you're not in, you're in trouble. You know, forget about it. I did that once, I paid the price. You know, he said, what if we would have got ambushed in there and we had to get away and you weren't in the car? And boy, I really got it, right? You know, you had a <laughs> meeting at eight o'clock. You had to be there by 730. You can never be late in that life. You're late in that life, you're in trouble. Traffic, there's no excuses. You be there. You get there the night before if you have to, but you're never late. You know, a lot of menial stuff like that. And look, you know, I always try to be as honest as I can. The life is very violent. And if you're, you know, at times, if you're involved in that life, you're going to be involved in the violence and there's no escape. And if anybody tells you differently, they're either lying to you or that they weren't a made member of that life. And I think you know what I mean. And um, so after two and a half years, you know, I proved myself worthy in their eyes. It was Halloween night, 1975. And I was called into a room uh, with five other gentlemen. We went into the room individually. The boss was seated at the head of like a horseshoe configuration, underboss consigliere to his left and right and all the copper regimes were alongside it. And we had about 15 in our family at that point. Walked down the aisle, stood in front of the boss, held out my hand, took a knife, cut my finger, some blood dropped on the floor. This is a blood oath. I cupped my hands. He took a picture of a saint, Catholic altar card, put it in my hands, lit it a flame. Didn't hurt it, burnt quickly, it was merely symbolic. And he said, tonight, Michael Francis, you are being born again into a new life, into Cosa Nostra, this thing of ours. Violate what you know about this life, betray your brothers, and you will die like the saint is burning in your hell, in your hands. And that's it. Die and burn in hell like the saint is burning in your hands. And do you accept? Yes, I do. And uh, that's the oath. And as soon as you take that oath, you know, people misunderstand what the oath is. People think that the oath is an oath to lie, steal, murder, and kill. That's not it. I mean, you know, you do bad things as part of that life. But the oath of Omerta is the oath of silence. You're not even supposed to admit that the life exists at all. And obviously I've broken the oath, uh, but it's an oath of silence. You know, we don't even admit. My, my dad would never even admit, admit that he was part of that life, you know, until later on in his life. But uh, that's what it's all about. But it's, look, it's very, very serious. I take that oath very seriously today, even though I don't consider myself a member of that life anymore. What I know about the life is in my heart, my mind. I spent over 20 years there, grew up in it, not easily forgotten. Um, but I don't consider myself a member of the life anymore. You know, there's, you know what they say. They say if you leave the life, you either leave in a coffin or you join the government and enter a witness protection program. Obviously, I've done neither. In that moment when you were taking the oath and you were had your hands cupped, bleeding, the flame of the saint card, what were you feeling in that moment? Kind of exhilaration, you know, like I said, I had a very idealistic view of the life and I said, wow, you know, it's finally here. I made it. I'm in. And I was 24 years old. I was young. Um, I was very excited. You know, I have to admit it. I was now part of something my dad was and I got this whole brotherhood behind me. I mean, I felt like, you know, a million dollars at that point. Soon to turn into eight to ten million dollars a week <laughs> under your leadership and business prowess. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, describe for us what your life and your duties were before you brought in the, the gas scheme, right? Before you rose essentially to the prominence and became a capo regime. All of a sudden, now you're a made member. What happens day two? Well, you're still on your own. Look, you know, there's there's two categories of people in that life. You're either a gangster or you're a racketeer. Now, a gangster normally can't be a racketeer, but a racketeer has to be some gangster in him also. So what do I mean by that? 
we had 115 made guys in the Colombo family, guys that actually took the oath. Out of that 115, 20 of us were earning money. I mean, real earners. The other 95, who's got a no-show job with the union, who's got a little numbers business, who might be trying to, you know, be a bookmaker, you know, stuff like that. They weren't really earners. And so when there was a lot of grunt work to be done or some serious work, it would mostly fall on them because you got to earn your keep in that life. The guys that were making money, well, they don't want to, you know, kill the golden goose. So they want you to keep, <clears throat> excuse me, bringing in the money. So I was more of a racketeer than a gangster in that regard because I, you know, I just knew how to use that life to benefit me in business. And that's what you had to do. You had to know how to use that life and make it work for you to benefit you in business. And I was able to do that. A lot of, you know, like the other guys were. So every day, you know, kind of an entrepreneur, I'm trying to find different things to do. Like I said, I had <clears throat> two automobile dealerships. Now, your legitimate businesses, they didn't have any part of. That was yours. Unless they were, you know, my boss was my partner or I took money from him or whatever. If not, then I was on my own. These were my companies, my businesses. But anything that I had on the street, I had to pay up to the family. So if I had Shylock business, I was lending money out. I had to pay up to the family. If I had bookmakers working for me and I was earning off of that, I had to pay up to the family. And I had both. And of course, the gas scheme, I had to pay up to the family because it was an illegal scheme. <coughs> Excuse me. So from day one, I'm out there trying to figure out how to earn a living. That was it. And how to create business and, and make money for myself. And I got involved in, and like I said, I was very aggressive. Uh, I got involved in a lot of different things. And then how did you work on, and as you said, you were ultimately successful in getting your dad out? You know, we got him out on parole and we just created, he was a good inmate and we created a, uh, you know, a fact pattern that the parole board looked favorably on. You know, he, he, he just fit the criteria and then they let him out. And he had, even though he had 50 years, um, you may know of this because you're, you're, I believe you're a lawyer, right, Emily? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay. He had what was called back then a, a sentence, meaning he didn't have to do any minimum amount of time to make parole. So he, he got 50 years, but he could have been paroled after one day. And the reason they gave him that sentence was they were hoping that he would turn an informant and they can release him at any time. That never happened. So he was eligible for parole immediately. So we kept working on it, working on it, working on it. And then after 10 years, they finally gave him his first break and he got paroled. But like I said, he kept going back. But what do we do? You know, I worked with lawyers. We created a, you know, a narrative that worked for him. He had a family. You know, his, uh, my grandmother was passing away. She was ill. So we had a lot of different factors that were, uh, you know, in his favor to get him parole that first time. And you mentioned before um, that you also were charged and acquitted and went through trials. Can you share about those? Yeah, well, I, I, I became a target immediately. You know, the minute I left school and got out on the street, I was a target because of my dad's high profile. So throughout the course of my career, I'll call it in that life, I had about 18 arrests. I had seven indictments. I had two federal racketeering uh, indictments and one state indictment. And then I had th th uh, four other cases. I went to trial five times. I was acquitted three times. I was dismissed uh, the other two. And one of the cases was uh, Rudy Giuliani brought it on in 84. I was the first major mob guy he indicted under the RICO statute. I was a lead defendant. I had 15 co-defendants. And uh, it's funny, Rudy will, will tell you this, you know, in the day of my arraignment, he gave me a million dollar bail. I was in the courtroom and he came up to me and my lawyer and he, he told my lawyer, he said, if I convict Francis on this case, He's getting double what his father got. He's going to get 100 years. And that's the kind of time they were giving us on racketeering cases back then, right? And, uh, and Rudy, I, I, ha I happened to sit down with him about a year ago on a radio show, and I reminded him of this, and he kind of laughed about it. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, I, I would say we're friends now. We have a good relationship, but tried to put me away for the rest of my life. Um, but And then ultimately, um, after I beat that case, I was acquitted after a several-month trial. My co-defendants, some of them got convicted. They got 30 years. 
So if I lost that case, you would have given me at least 50. I, I probably wouldn't be talking to you today. And it was a, it was basically a white collar crime. It was it wasn't, you know, anything, uh, um, you know, a violence in it or anything. But um, I ultimately took a plea, you know, to this whole gas tax thing. It was another racketeering case. And that, that's where I ended up doing my time. Which was eight years. Well, I got a 10 year prison sentence and I did eight on the 10. I maxed out. And I had a $15 million restitution and I had $5 million in forfeitures. So they, uh, but believe it or not, it was a good deal. It was a good deal for me because when I got 10 years, Emily, during that time, guys were congratulating me. You know, they said, oh, Mike, when you go to, don't even take your shoes off, you'll be before, home before you know it. Because guys were getting 50 years, 100 years. It was crazy the kind of time they were giving out, you know. So really, so I was blessed with 10 years. And inside, each day really feels like a lifetime, but then it goes by in the aggregate sort of fast, which is a weird, a weird phenomenon in there. Um, yeah. What struck me, I